good evening good evening all i harshvardhan dadichi and i varna we would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone present here as members of the entire committee it is a great pleasure to be in your presence webinars are organized and conducted for the general audience to gain insight and information that would remain effective in their life work and exercises so as a result our topic for today's training session was chosen keeping the students interests in mind our last webinar the beginners guide to autodesk fusion 360 was graced with positive feedback from the students and teachers so to keep the enthusiastic termites enthused we have created a new training session i would like to introduce the new topic for today's training session rocket science fundamentals in this course we'll explain the working and dynamics of a rocket only using classical physics and our experience let's learn about the advanced technologies involved in making a rocket in this beginner friendly course thank you harshvardhan for the introduction to the training concourse i would like to remind our audience that this is a certified training course of 6 days that will teach you the basics and operation of rocketry from scratch also we have a certificate of training for our attendees students will receive a feedback time feedback form any time in the session which they can fill out to get the certificate free of cost and now for the big surprise let's go back to harsh guys the wait is over here we have with us dr rudy and i cannot share my excitement to welcome him as our expert trainer dr rudy has a long history as an educator and scientist with a demonstrated ability to mentor students and solve technical problems formerly he worked as a material scientist and propulsion chemist at nasa msfc while at msfc he worked with student interns to develop and test combinations of hyperbolic fuel and hydrogen peroxide currently dr rudy is a tenured professor at triton college where he guides scholars on their path to achieve stem careers Thank you, Dr. Rudy, for joining us today. And again, I welcome you wholeheartedly to this concourse. Thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity. I'm very excited to uh, work with my new friends across the world, and I think that you uh, have a great potential for what you can accomplish there. And uh, as being another uh, member of of a spacefaring uh, world, and um, Other than that, um, I will return it to our MC for him to direct me in my next thing I need to do. But Sorry. welcome everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rudy. Now, as we begin today's session and fire fire you with the questions that our audience has for you, we would like to first give you and the audience a small introduction to SAT and its work. Thank you, Varna. Now, as we begin the session, I would like to introduce Sark so that everyone here, the newcomers and all, everyone knows why we are here and what is Sark. I'll just start the presentation in a minute. Greetings, everyone. It is good to see almost fifty plus fifty plus people with us right now. Many of you are familiar with Sark and the work we do. Nevertheless, some newcomers have heard about Sark only through this event, and I want this presentation from all of you. Though, and for those all of you who have wanted to know about Sark, there we go. We are a society of space enthusiasts. And a bit about us: we are a bunch of students working towards creating a community of enthusiasts. passionate about space exploration and to work on this mission we have planned some long term goals such as building a long, building a sounding rocket to create a leading platform for uh, people in, in uh, who are interested in astronomy to share our knowledge by conducting seminars live sessions live demonstration and other such social activities and to fulfill our long term goals we have taken several uh, steps and risky jumps in the past two years such as uh in the january of 2020 we had our first breakthrough when we developed our own rocket motors with potassium permanganate as fuel and we had five successful tests in the january of 2020 then by june we had a lot of experience in our hand with competitions and successful tests and we decided to share our learnings with students all over the world through social platforms and we impacted about 2000 students through our teachings in august we were able to register our college under isro's database of educational institutions 
and by the end of the year 2020 we had seven preliminary asteroid discoveries we had represented india in citizen science program by pan star telescope and in the month of march in the month of march 2021 our efforts were recognized and we were inducted as a society now we use this platform to conduct live events and we have almost 700 plus live attendees in total now why sark why is it involved so much in space and why would why do you need it well, India has a large pool of space enthusiasts. Those involved in the space sector, from students to job holders to executives, need a platform to showcase their skills and work together to advance the industry. Each year, tens of thousands of students apply to work in India's space industry, but only few are accepted. India's space sector has the potential to accommodate this growing talent pool. How can you and uh, how can you utilize SARC? How can you utilize SARC to build your own Plat uh, portfolio well in order to implement it you need to grow from learning to doing we all have our enthusiasm and we learn a lot from youtube videos and books but we need to go to implement them we can you can use your enthusiasm in building developing and innovating to contribute the to the space sector by joining us and we you can also promote your own academic potential and develop soft skills through webinars well how can you be a part of us for that, we have made a new program just for you, the General Space Alliance Program. The General Space Alliance Program will promote space culture globally, where experienced people come, share their experience, teach, and help people grow in their career in space. We invite you, we invite everyone, we invite all of you to come share your experiences, share your expertise, grow along with your prayers, and make career in the field of space science. What does it cost? What are the requirements to join us? Well, basically, we do not demand much from you. We only demand that you contribute your knowledge and support the community as we strive to redefine space. Come join us, guys. Thank you, Harsh. I'm sure that it must have helped our audience understand our goal and motive. So coming back to the most impo important part of today's session. Yeah, now we'll share some questions with Dr. Rudy. Uh, people have been waiting for this time. Thank you, Varna. Dr. Rudy, when we're ready, we shall start. Anytime. Oh, before we do, though, I was just thinking uh, that uh, what's making, I think in one way, what's making this all possible is, un is another side of this terrible pandemic that we're all experiencing. And I have, my heart goes out to India because I know that you folks are really suffering right now with that. But it also has flattened out the world to make it possible that someone in Illinois and in the United States can be working with someone in India. And I also am working with people in Poland and in South Korea. And this it may have not been possible before, but because of this turn to the virtual world due to avoiding COVID, I, I think it's it's helping to bring this about. But go ahead now. I just wanted to share that. That's true, Dr. Rudy. I think there is a silver side to the pandemic, as you say. Yes, I think there is. We we'll just have to learn from it going yes. ahead. So, Dr. Rudy, uh, we'll start with one of the most basic questions. You are the lead at Triton College and Fisk University Rocket Propulsion Team. Your team has also been accepted into the NASA Mines program. We are also a club, we have just started, and we are looking for opportunities to grow and develop. How do you believe these clubs help in contributing to the development of students in the field of space science and even their overall growth? Well, I, I just answered these just a few minutes ago, but um, I think that, that what we should be looking at right now is Elon Musk and SpaceX and uh, Gretchen uh, Whitmore, I believe is her name, who is the chief operating officer of SpaceX. And they are making the most significant developments in space travel right now with the vertical on land landing of a rocket booster to allow it to be reused. And so if we if we think about SpaceX and, and, my, and my knowledge of them, uh, they are principally operating with young people. The average person there is 25 to 35 years old. And 
the, the people that, we, that I'm working with, that you're working with, uh, they are the most likely candidates for their, their jobs. I mean, they have a few senior people, but the majority of them are, are very young, fresh out of undergraduate and graduate programs in propulsion and, and the aerospace. And uh, some of the, the people that are there right now were interns at the NASA academies and in particular the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center Propulsion Academy. I was the coordinator of that some time ago and some of those people are currently working for SpaceX and some of the other companies such as Ball Aerospace um, that's building the world's largest solar sail. So um, I think that what you're doing is uh, training those those people along with their, 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 their training in school, you know, in, in aerospace and engineering, mathematics, computer science, uh, for those kinds of jobs. Yes, exactly. I mean, the only way to go forward in space science is not just to academic, but we also have other career options that we can apply, such as mm -hmm. educators, and right. elementary students, yes. and even yes. clubs. Yes. Exactly. SpaceX, as you said, also employs very young people. I mean, below 35 is the average age right. of people employed there. And also your team, our team, everyone is young here. I mean, I think the most of the people who are present in the live session are also young. And I think they uh, they match with the points that you said. They think it's correct. And uh, I've seen your quote for you, sir. And I saw that you have a strong background in the field of space science. And I even now renowned worldwide for your experience in this field. But I'm sure, Dr. Rudy, you must have started somewhere. I'm sure you must have, uh, you can say that you have looked back and seen where you started. Uh, I would love to know, how did you stumble upon this field? Or did you, were you uh, excited about this field from childhood? Or did you go to college and then saw it, the academic potential of this field and went through it? I would love to know, how did you start in this field? Um, as a child, uh, in the 60s, 1960s, I remember um, watching uh, on the television uh, Walter Cronkite and other uh, news commentators talking about the developments of the space program. And then in particular, I remember the first moon landing, and I was with my parents at a trade show, uh, and every booth, every, every desk at that trade show had a television black and white there was no color at the time it was black and white large but considered portable televisions uh using vacuum tubes and uh they uh they were all showing the, the moon landing and everyone was so excited about that and i and i remember that excitement and so i went out and i bought plastic models of various vehicles and i bought the uh the hobby rocket kits that would use compressed gunpowder with a ceramic nozzle and the balsa wood and cardboard tubes and that kind of thing. And they didn't launch very reliably because at the time they were using a, a, a different system than the hobby rockets use nowadays and it just did not work very well. But my career was not planned. Okay. I, <laughs> I just took opportunities as they came along. I took various paths and change directions. And I know that's not as easy nowadays as it was at that time. At that time, you could do that. And it's not as easy in some of the education systems in other countries. It, I know it's very prescribed and you have to pass certain exams or you're not even allowed. But I, also, I remember when I was in graduate school, I had some friends from India and they were talking about how anyone that passed certain tests could proceed through college and through graduate school and the the, the the country was paying for it. I don't know if that's still true, but it was true back in the, the 90s. And so um, anyway, it was not planned. It, it was all a matter of chance and, and accident. I, I never really expected to end up doing it. And I remember when I first stepped foot on uh, Marshall Space Flight Center uh, soil, and it was early morning. I was there before everyone else showed up because I was excited about being there. And I looked up in the sky and I could see the moon. And I thought, this is the place that built the rockets, that trained some of the astronauts, that took people to the moon. And that was very exciting. 
Yes, exactly. I think uh, the point you said about the moon landings, I think I've heard so many astronauts and even astrophysicists talk about getting their inspiration as a child while seeing that moon landing. I remember people like Scott Kelly, Karan Jani, astrophysicist and uh, astronomers, Scott Kelly, everyone just says the same thing. They saw moon landing, they, they got inspired by it and they decided yeah. that this was the field that they wanted to get into. And to the viewers here, I would like to repeat the same line that uh, Dr. Rudy said earlier. Just th that was, I just took the opportunities. Even though they were hard, even though it took a lot of time, but Dr. Rudy, as jo Dr. Rudy uh, said, you should do the same. Just take opportunities in the field as you go through it. You'll see if it fits for you, or if, it, uh, if it doesn't, we can work it out. But I think uh, taking opportunities and working on it is the most important part as I understood. Having a passion from childhood always helps a lot. It good, it's good to know that uh, it was not planned, so that we also get a bit of consciousness yes. to other people. Everything is not planned. We can go through it. Like wow. Also, uh, people in the section, uh, comment section, you, can, uh, you guys can comment. Any questions if you have, we'll go through along it and we'll ask some of them here also. And uh, I'll again take the same point again. I think uh, our e audience is also eager to know about the qualifications and strengths required to get into the field. Do you think there are some limitations? Can you share your views on this? Are there any limitations? Or is there nothing like that? We can always have our qualities and then specialize in them to work in the space side field. Is there any limitation to the academic ability that is required? What are the uh, important skills and subjects required? I think most of this can be learned. And, um, but there is one thing that's a more of a challenge and that is creativity. Uh, I never felt that I was had, had a sufficient amount of creativity to uh to to come up with the new big next thing but that's what you need you look at elon musk and he has taken his what some people would call a disorder but i think it's actually just a different way of looking at the world of of having um uh i'm forgetting right now the what he actually has but i think it has allowed him to be creative it has allowed him to look at the world in a different way if we consider um van gogh van gogh saw the world in a different way and therefore he was able to create those paintings because of his point of reference and his in his view of the world and that allowed him to be creative so uh, i had some notes here on this question creativity I think is the key um, understanding how to find information in the world that we're in right now is key. It's not carrying it all in your head. You cannot do that. You need to know how to find information in the quickest way, what databases to look to, to be able to find that information. Uh, you do need a sound basis in mathematics, science, that kind of thing. Of course that is, but you can, you can attain that with work and being organized in your studies and then you can you can get that part but creativity is the is the one thing the only thing you can do i think is to keep taking on problems such as what you're giving people with your attempt at building a sounding rocket and the same thing at triton college and where we're doing the same sort of thing fisk university and some of the schools that are giving people an opportunity to build a working device and then that got, gives you an opportunity to then bring up that creativity that you're going to need all right so the three points that i think are to be highlighted are that creativity is important if you wish to go ahead in the field creativity is the most important part even not academic ability and the ability to find your information in the quickest way you don't have to have everything in your head you if you have the ability to find information uh, in your quickest way, then you also have a bonus point and you also have to have sound uh, means basic ability to solve mathematics and scientific problems. Right? Uh, sound ability and maths and science. Sanjay has a similar question, Sanjay, our viewer, that all throughout your experience, as you said, many freshers are working or do you feel in uh, engineers lack? I think uh, they don't lack anything. I think we just need to keep working on as a freshers, we need to continue working. Yeah. 
yeah so the three points are again i'll again say it so that every learner understands every listener creativity how to find your info in the quickest way and basic knowledge of maths and science that you can work on if you need higher knowledge that you can work on with proper education that you do yourself okay there are also other questions we'll we'll go through them sir i'll do you think sir new news uh uh there is one another interesting question i think uh, that says ki uh, do you think all the materials will be exchanged or replaced for better materials in the future do you think material scientists are also working for better materials or we have reached the stale point in no, rocket no that's that, that's certainly where that, that's certainly where i think a lot of the uh, the future developments will occur Um, I believe that propulsion is going to be the key to okay. uh, to uh, to access the space. It has to be efficient, and it has to be less expensive. We have to reduce the cost per pound of getting material into space. Uh, and with that, there's some other areas: rapid prototyping, which has made a lot of breakthroughs uh, with 3D printing, being able to print metal. a lot of the um parts of the uh of the SpaceX vehicles are uh 3D printed in metal especially in the turbo pumps for the uh liquid propulsion uh uh they the, the the paths through it are so tortuous it's so difficult to machine something like that using conventional even using uh a CMC a computerized uh control of your milling machine it's just too difficult to do so they are now making those those parts using 3D printing with with metal and obviously doing it very effectively um the other thing is re reduction in the size of devices even further and i'll delve off into a, just a bit of science fiction here but it seems that science fiction is becoming reality in many cases it's a predictor of the future in many cases and one of my favorite authors is uh, Cory Doctorow and uh in in one of his uh science fiction novels he was predicting the ability to download a person's consciousness into a computer and then to bring it back into the person and to also put it into other living organisms but the thing i thought that was really interesting was to send just the information out into space with a device that was able to make all of those individuals out in space and they could then put that consciousness into those people and they are there and they and they sent out a a probe that is the size of uh, you know maybe uh, 10 20 uh, centimeters cube very small to do that. Now, of course, we can't do that right now. But uh on the other hand, Elon Musk has put a computer inside a pig's head uh that is that is then talking to a uh, outside computer. And who's to say where that's all going to go? And maybe it's distributed computing um something like that. I don't know. But there but we have to think outside of the current paradigm to where we can efficiently get people out in the space. And my my last item I had on here was integrated health and repair of structures. We've already done some work on that, but where we embed sensors into structural parts to where we know the health of that. Obviously that would have been very important in the uh second uh space shuttle disaster to have known what was going on on the surfaces, but we didn't know that. and then to be able to heal those materials somehow to be able to send out an, an epoxy or some other adhesive with maybe some particles in it to reinforce it and if we can develop that the where we can have what is essentially an organic an organic vehicle that can 
sense itself and repair itself, that's going to be needed, especially in a long-term flight into the outer uh, regions of the solar system, because we can't fix it. We can't bring it back to Earth in an expedient fashion without probably losing a crew. So those sorts of developments are going to have to happen, I think, to be to be able to do this. Exactly. I mean, uh, building yourself up. And I think research on it has started because uh, uh, SpaceX also sent cargo which had which had 3D printers in it mm -hmm. to I International Space Station and the mission was also successful. So the experiment was successful. They were able to use 3D printers in space. I think that will yeah, that is the first step to right. the process of digital selection that you have informed about us. And Sai Samarth has an interesting question. Who can see us undergrads and grads proceed in the field? Sai, I have the exact same question from here uh, for Dr. Rudy. I'll come back to you later. Okay. Vinay, what is the future of rocket technology after reusable rockets? Uh, this is an interesting question. Dr. Rudy, uh, what do you think is the next step once we have reusable rockets? What do you think will be the next big thing? This this is a question that will take time, I think. Again, uh, right now, reusable rockets are the big thing. So we'll only be yeah. focusing on um, it, it's certainly essential, and and the fact that the the crew that went to the space station was uh, in a second use capsule and a third use booster, I believe that's correct, oh. and uh, that that was the promise of the space shuttle that we did not really deliver on because the remanufacture of the boosters was too expensive, and obviously resulted in some failures. So um, they have succeeded in that, in that arena. And it's just going to be a matter of maintaining the safety. We cannot become lax. You know, if, if we take space travel and we start thinking of it as being essentially the same as traveling on an airliner, it'll that will never be true. And, and, the, uh, and the risks are, are certainly much greater. So we're going to have to be reliable. Um, we have to keep reducing cost for us to be able to take um, uh, people to uh, colonize Mars. Um, and I, I really can't think of anything else, but I think those two are the main, are the main things that we, we have to make sure that we can maintain the safety of the crew and that we can continue to reduce the cost effectively. And and you know, and this is so critical that it's running on one man. I, uh, I, I, I that part um, is intriguing. It also terrifies me because if something happens to Elon Musk, who's <laughs> probably not one of the safest individuals on the planet, I think he takes some risk with himself. Um, if he were to go away, I don't know what would happen. Really, I mean. Uh, Gwen that runs SpaceX, I'm, and she's very competent, but I, as uh, Simon Sinek, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but uh, you have to have that individual that is synonymous with whatever the uh, activity is. And the belief that, um, the, the belief in that and that goal, and then people adopt that, they want to be a part of it, and they work hard, not because they're being paid, but they're working hard because they believe in that goal. Exactly. Right. Uh, but also, I think the same applies for other people. Even if uh, Elon Musk decides to not work for space exploration, I don't think that will happen in this world. But if, even if something happens, I think he has inspired so many people right. that someone will come up again and pick up his work and advance it into something else. I think it will take a lot of time, but there are people who are inspired by uh, individuals like Elon Musk and they will continue the work no matter what happens. Moving ahead, Herschel. Uh, your question is exactly the question that will that will be answered after this seminar. If you take part in the six day register, if you register in our six day program, you'll answer these questions and many more. We have a course on rocket propulsion after the questionnaire with Dr. Rudy. Yes, ion propulsion. This is a good question by Pulsating Genius. Um, I. 
keeping a secret by space agencies is a bit hard i think if you are developing I means working on something the the person is asking if there is something that scientists are working out which we don't know of i don't think uh, space agencies try to keep secrets of propulsion propulsive yeah. energies no but i think uh, do you think iron propulsion will be used i think i think that's what uh, we are mostly developing it for uh, space travel right for for satellite for, for, uh... For uh, in space travel, yeah, it's it's uh, one of the most promising. Uh, at least I, I haven't been okay. I, I worked in the propulsion research center at Marshall for uh, I don't know three or four years, and uh, people were working on those kinds of things. They were working on uh, antimatter, uh, using that as a as an energy source. Uh, they they had. They were working towards a containment um, structure to be able to transport it because it would be produced. Um, I think maybe Oak Ridge uh, National Labs was the ones that was going to produce that. Um, but I, I don't think there's, I mean, of course, on the military side, who knows what they're doing over there. Uh, they certainly have to maintain a competitive advantage and so they may be pursuing things um, but then on the other hand that would not be uh, most of the time that's deliver a weapon which uh you're not worried about uh if it fails if it blows up you lost your weapon you didn't lose a crew uh, and with a, a drone type of uh type of vehicle of course there's no no living person inside so again you could use something that has a greater risk attached to it. But as far as um, propulsion that is that could be man rated, I, I think we I, I think we know what's what, what's currently out there. And of course, the chemical propulsion continues to be the dominant uh, method. Uh, but as I was saying earlier, um, my former intern and friend now, uh, Matt Canella, which it would be, <laughs> he knows about this. I don't think he could join us. He's a little bit too busy, but he's, he's uh, working on uh, the propulsion to deliver the world's largest solar sail to get it out to the sun so it could then open and then collect the solar wind and accelerate it past the earth and out into the outer uh, areas of the solar system. And, you know, that's another great technology. There's no propellant to worry about uh, getting, getting up, our, our, our biggest problem, I think, in, in propulsion, of course, is the gravity well of the Earth. We, we, have to, we have to get past it. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to get to low Earth orbit. Once we're to low Earth orbit, we can use these lower thrust uh, devices such as ion propulsion and stuff for in-space travel. But getting out there is, uh, from the Earth's surface is still a big challenge, and that will require more successes. So I think for uh, satellites and unmanned uh, vehicles in space, I think we can use ion propulsion. But for other chemical, uh, for manned space flight, I think chemical mm -hmm. propulsion is the domin in, in dominant stage right now. We have a lot of work to do at that part. Hemant, okay. Moscow. Oh, I, I was just going to say, the, the other area is using uh, nuclear. Uh, the problem there is the resistance of the public to want to launch a reactor into space because they're concerned about failure in the lock on the launch and then it breaking up and distributing radioactive material. And when I was at the Propulsion Research Center, our director actually hired a cultural anthropologist to try to think of ways that we could, for lack of a better word, pitch that to the public to convince them that it's safe and that it, it, they should agree to it and that's i don't know that we've gotten a lot of traction on that uh, even now yeah using the word uh, nuclear propulsion around general public is a bit dangerous i don't think people yeah. really people get a scared bit scared when they hear nuclear but i think with missions like voyager and mars missions working through nuclear energy i think we can properly uh, do such missions with safety right. after a bit of the research. Unmanned vehicles have been using nuclear energy for a long time. Right. 
Hemant, Mossam, Anarg, Bose. A lot of people have a lot of questions. Guys, shoot out your questions. We'll ask them. But our members also have some of the questions. And I'll uh, ask one of them. This is a big question, Dr. Rudy. And I think this is also important for the viewers because a lot of people are scared to start. They do not want to fail. But I understand that rocketry and research is a field full of experiments. And sometimes they fail. Sometimes they give us undesired re results. I, and I also understand, I know that you, through the years, you also must have stumbled upon a lot of problems yourself. And you must have faced them and grown through them. How do you want us to tackle as student researchers or as students, interns, from your experience, how do you think we should face failures or even problems? Well, <laughs> I, I hate to keep turning to Elon Musk, but what else can we do here since he's the star? Um, they've had a lot of failures. They've, they've lost. They've lost vehicles. And every time they ask him about it, he just says it was a great experiment and we learned and we're ready to, to go to the next step. And, um, and of course, he has to say that uh, because it is a for profit venture. But um, but it is certainly true that you are going to have if, if you go to uh, YouTube and look for examples of rockets blowing up. You'll find plenty of those very dramatic yeah. explosions and structural failures. That's going to happen for sure. And um, I, I, I actually had some notes that were related to this. And I think that the thing about it that, that Musk and SpaceX and everyone else that's, that, that continues onward with that is that you um, is that you have to understand what the problem was. You have to be able to, to do a post-mortem on that loss of a vehicle or of a device to understand uh, what happened and then uh, to break it down into steps. And at that point, it just becomes a, a technical exercise of how to address what happened. And of course, you're trying to predict in advance all the possible failure modes for, for uh, any vehicle or device. And uh, that's a challenge uh, to do. Um, and sometimes the project manager doesn't want you to be quite so eager to find the possible failure modes because they want to get it done, get it going, not be, as they might say, wasting time on thinking about what might happen. But it's essential. We were, I'll be talking on, uh, on the green propulsion, I'll be talking about uh, the X-37, which was to be taken up in the cargo bay of the space shuttle and flown back to Earth. And that was canceled. It was given to the Air Force. And um, I was one of the people that was saying, I don't think we should lock that into the cargo bay and take a chance with the astronauts. And the project manager <laughs> tried to keep me from saying that because they don't want to hear that. And, um, and then we had a, another time we had a, a launch being on, on hold at Kennedy Space Center because I did not think we should go because we didn't understand what had happened in, in a previous launch. Eventually, I was overridden by other people and they went ahead and did, and did a subsequent launch but they never understood what what happened. And fortunately, it never happened again. I'll be talking about that one later on. So uh, we can only use learning as an experience and we can understand what happened. Then you, you try to avoid that again. I think that's right. important. Also, I'm seeing that uh, in general public, also with students, the a career in NASA or space agencies, other space countries, space agencies like ISRO, ESA, JAXA, seems like the only place for engineers and scientists. We always think of NASA as a place filled with engineers and scientists. I see you nodding. Um, is there scope for other provincials? I need you to tell everyone this, that it is oh, not yes. just... Oh, engineers. yeah. There, um, I think that virtually any field of study could find a job at NASA. Um, the engineers may not like that. They may think it should only be engineers and mathematicians. But uh, the, the truth is that there's plenty of opportunities 
uh, in any area. In fact, um, you have to have people to actually do all the mechanical aspects of this, and those are technicians. The technicians training in many cases were they were trained as an auto mechanic. They were trained as a plumber, as an electrician, doing the trades, and then they work for a contractor, and they're the ones that are out building the launch structures, the test structures, the testing. Uh, it's done by these technicians. So you could come into this at any place. I had a young man that was working on my automobile the other day. He said when he was younger, he was considering uh, working for NASA. Uh, that that's what he wanted to be an astronaut. But then he got distracted in school and didn't pursue that. I said, well, you know, you could still do that now. I could tell you exactly five places to call in Huntsville, Alabama, and you would probably get a job working as a technician. And then if you really think about what you're doing and, and, and keep moving forward, you can advance up in that company. And one of my good friends, he still works for a contractor. He does not work for the agency. And uh, he wants it to be that way. And he, uh, well, he, uh, he, he is in the game and he's not even working for NASA, he's working for a contractor. And I don't know how that's done with, with ESA and the other, the other uh, people, but certainly with, with NASA, that, that is the way, it, the way it works. All right, so there is scope. I also wanted to focus on two topics which are uh, very popular. Like, is there scope for the, in the space industry for professionals in maybe psychology, educators, elementary teachers and all? Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I well, I'll talk about that later. But my experience at the at the NASA Office of Education at headquarters, I can talk about it then. Later. Sure, sure. Uh, Doctor Rudy, I also wanted to know personally which uh, like future aspect of the industry are you most excited about of the space industry? Is it space travel or it is mission to Mars or maybe exoplanets, JWST? Yes. There are so many. I don't know. I can't say. There, there's no. I can't. I can't. I tell you what. I'm most excited about my vision for the future is that me and my good friend uh, Kent Wallace at Fisk University uh, that we're able to form a nonprofit corporation where we are designing and building uh, satellite launch vehicles for CubeSats. I don't know if you're familiar what a CubeSat is. It's a small satellite, roughly 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. And uh, currently they're, they're being launched. Well, initially they were being launched as a secondary cargo on a satellite launch. And now we have companies that are building sounding rockets to get them, to get them into, um, and they, they only go around the earth a few, a few revolutions and they burn up. And what I would like to see to be able to do is have a nonprofit corporation to be able to provide launches to schools that could never afford to pay for this, to find a way that, that their students could design, build these CubeSats and then launch them uh, for them. And then they would get the experience of having the telemetry of bringing down their data. And that is what I'm the most excited about is giving students that kind of opportunity to where then they can go on and do the big things because I, I was at the place for the big things and um, I mean it would be cool to work for SpaceX. There's no no, no question about it, but um, I would be I would be thrilled with doing that. And then with uh, I, you're probably familiar with Space Camp that we have here, where the, the you know it's a residential camp for a week for. Kindergartners, well, not kindergartners, it wouldn't be residential, but I think probably middle school out to high school. And uh, I would like to have the same thing attached to this other organization to where students could come in and work for a week on that, that uh, endeavor. And that to me would be the most exciting thing. Uh, not the, I mean, I want to see those other things happen, but I think that's for other people. Okay. So things that are influential for people here will right. be the most important aspect for right. you. Yes. yes, to work with you guys, for example. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dr. Rudy. Yeah. And uh, now we are the generation, I think, Dr. Rudy, that will follow up on you, will pick up the work that you did and continue it. 
and uh, if you could give us which aspect of rocketry or space science do you think uh, like which uh, aspect of rocketry should we start working on which aspect do you think needs a lot of work and uh, but it is important in the long term of space science like with upcoming generation cubesats are going to be revolutionary for colleges even sounding rockets but i think they are saturating a bit you also have a lot of research to do well the well of course the other areas if you uh use a uh, balloons and and take up a a a, huh. a cubesat like device on, on on a balloon that's that's easier to do um hmm. and there's there's a, there's a lot of that that's going on um but really i think that um and, and, and if i understood your question you're talking about what you think sark should be doing is, is that is that what you're asking me or you're asking me a different question yeah, sark and also the people here they might join isro or other space agencies in the future which part right. do you think the younger generation should pick up and work a bit more on a part that is not worked on about I, I I think the experience of of building rockets from a model rocket that's roughly this big to a high powered rocket, and can you hold just a second? I forgot about sure. this. Guys, if you have questions, go for it. Uh, this is the last question. After that, we'll interact with you guys. I thought I'd just bring this out. So, um, you know, this is a. Um, a smaller high powered rocket that i have flown many times i haven't done it lately and uh you know you, you need to be building small rockets that are this big that run on the uh, the black powder you need to be building rockets like this that are running on the p band uh based um uh, uh engines and then you just work to bigger and bigger and bigger and then get into liquid propulsion and then uh once you get the experiences with that to then uh to, to then get into the industry and be able to work on the big things dr rudy i, I think i think people would like to see the rocket again i am very excited i think you need to it again to us oh okay uh, oh i got a low ceiling so i can't I'll tell you what let me step back a little bit okay i still can't Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. We can see. I'm, I, um, I'm on the risk of falling. So, uh, but anyway, there you go. Yeah. So My this, God, is, this is beautiful. This is a. Um, let's see. This is a cardboard tube. Nothing real. Just cardboard. Plastic nose cone. Um, the fins are pl plywood, birch plywood. Uh, there's a motor retainer here it's just some hardware and then the uh, the motor slides in there you have the what's called the launch lug that a rod goes through to guide it when you initially uh, ignite the uh, the motor because it's not stable until it starts moving and then uh we've got the nose cone i've not looked at this and sometimes so i'm not sure what i'm going to find in there hopefully there's no spiders um but uh, then there's a parachute like that this and this amazing. whole thing comes down and the um the solid motor that that propels that has a explosive charge so that when it reaches the end of the burn it ignites that explosive charge it pushes out the uh, the parachute and the nose cone, and of course that creates a humongous amount of <laughs> that's a scientific word a humongous a very a very large amount of drag. So the vehicle slows very a, a lot just from the taking it apart and and creating all that area. And it's no longer aerodynamically stable, and then the parachute then takes over and brings it down uh, in a gentle fashion, hopefully. Uh, this was an exciting part of the session. This was a surprise for everyone, I think. We didn't know this was going to happen. Oh, well, you want me to do something it. else? Here we go. We'll do this too while we're at it. Um, yeah, sure. I, th I think our viewers yeah. will love everything that you show. So, about um, this is a rapid prototype, uh, 3D printed um, 
thruster, if I can get in the right, you know, here we go. That's why I keep getting messed oh, yeah. up on it. But, but this is uh, the design of the thruster that at Triton and Fist that we're going to be machining in metal. And uh, I can show you the metal pieces later that we're going to then convert into the, the center section here where the catalyst goes and these uh, bulkheads. Well, thank you, Dr. Rudy. That 3D printed objects are always fascinating. It's always oh, yeah. uh, very fascinating to see how something is printed through the layers and layers and layers. It's very cool. And yeah, now course, there are from the, uh, but that comes from the Fusion 360. Once you've created your design in Fusion 360, you export as an STL file, and then you put that into your. It, we have to use a, a program called a slicer that creates the way the uh, the way the plastic is laid down. There's different ways you can make it hollow, you can make it solid, and then uh, and then you print it. And of course, you could not use that as a as an actual uh, thruster, of course, it would burn up instantly. It'd be it'd be very dramatic, but not a good idea. Um, no. But but you can certainly test the fit and the just the way the design is going to come together before you go to machining uh, in metal and stainless steel. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Doctor Rudy. Now yes. there are some questions in the YouTube comments, and people are also showing some interest. So I'll, I'll see which questions, the, all the comments, and I'll sort the questions. Uh, Hemant is asking, Hemant Agarwal, what about your views on full flow stage combustion cycle engines and its advantages? <laughs> um, I am ignorant of this. I have no idea. Yeah, that is this is more for an actual engineer. I'm a chemist. I'm a, a uh, yeah. material scientist, and I know just enough of the engineering part to, as some people would say, be dangerous, but not but not qualified. Full flow. My my friend Matt Canella could certainly answer that, but he's not here. That's okay. Uh, people asking questions. Focus on material science and. Uh, chemistry okay uh, there is another uh, good question about the strength what can we do to reduce the weight of rocket structures are there new materials that are being developed to do this or maybe you can change the design are there people working on it right now to reduce the weight of rocket structures right uh, well of course the um, fiber composites are uh, you know, they're, they're great. You can do so many things with that. And there's so, uh, there's, um, it's been, it's, it's being used. It was being used even when I was still at the agency uh, to make some of the structural parts. Um, and um, that's, that's certainly a way to, to do that is with fiber composites. And, you know, fiber composites are kind of interesting in, 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 historically, I think. I was reading a book about the uh, native people that lived in North America and South America prior to the colonization by the Europeans. And uh, anyway, um, and after they killed the majority of them, um, and they had, uh, they, they had already conceived fiber composite material. They would use... Uh, fibers from plants, weave them together, and then reinforce them with some sort of a binder, making a very strong object. And they found that out, and then they developed that quite extensively. And then we have stumbled onto this many years later, thinking we were geniuses for coming up with this, but actually they found that on their own. And um, I, I think that's one place for that. Um, Another area that I don't know if it's being used yet is back to the um, back to the 3D printing. Um, I don't think you can really see this, no matter how close I get it. But yeah, you, you can see how that's not this. I ran out of plastic prior to the completion of this, so you're seeing actually what's inside here. And this has a particular structure in here 
that is just um, it's cubes in, inside there uh, for that structure. But there is a another there, there's several different ways to go with that. And there is one um, and I, the name escapes me now, but it is it's as if you had um, you know how to say this. Um, it's it's like spheres that are nested in and out of each other and it transmits the load through all of that and makes a very strong interior and i think that that something like that could be used to to reduce the weight uh, but you would still maintain the, the structural integrity of it so um that would be a interesting area to go i'm i assume someone's doing it but i don't know maybe not okay fiber fiber yeah, fiber composites going ahead and Hemant Agarwal also has an interesting question that star step yeah I um, they're going I mean, with what viable. They're, they're going with what we have known you, you know the von Braun in Germany of course was the father of all of this and uh, he was um, using Hitler's ambitions to pay for his rocketry experiments and he uh he was showing he was showing hitler that he was going to put a space station in low earth orbit and it was comical he showed he showed uh, the uh the the nazi soldiers shooting rifles from the space platform and you know hitler and all of his people thought were quite excited about that and uh and of course you know he developed the buzz bomb that they used to uh, to uh to attack uh great britain from you know from, from germany and uh that you know you know so that's you know the origins go back to to, to then and, and to using uh steel you know and uh welding it together um I, we have aluminum alloys that are quite good. Uh, there was a gentleman at at Marshall that developed a lot of the new uh, aluminum alloys, and they could be using those. But I think they're going with, with stainless. Just oh, I, well, one reason why they're going with stainless is uh, to avoid um, corrosion issues and setting on the pad. Uh, that that's a that's a challenge in Florida. Uh, we had to do a lot of work on uh, corrosion control there because of the constant salt spray and uh, humidity. So perhaps that's the reason. But I really don't know why they're not doing it other than they, they tend to take a very conservative approach. They're using uh, many small uh, liquid, propul liquid propulsion engines on their uh on their launch vehicle rather than rather than three they're using i don't know how many 15 or something so they can lose about three or four of those it would have no effect on the flight uh they can transition uh they they can work out these the uh the asymmetry of the, of the thrust and make it work so they, they tend to go in a conservative fashion but now but in some places they go high tech like that 3d printing of those uh steel parts of their um uh, their uh their uh, motors so i don't know i i really don't know why they're doing that though i think the another thing could be that carbon fiber is hard to obtain and they are planning on making about a hundred starships by the end right. of uh, two decades i think they use stainless steel because it is easier to obtain they could easily reuse it again and again well, another, re I just thought of this, uh, it's still a challenge to be able to determine uh, the integrity of, of a uh, carbon fiber um, device. You, you, it's, it's hard to see inside it, uh, you know, even with x-ray and uh, very, various other ways to probe it. I, I think that's still a challenge. And, um, and also it's subject to to issues in manufacturing. I know there was a time when uh, we built, uh, when, when NASA built a carbon fiber composite uh, liquid oxygen tank. And 
uh, they filled it. Everything was fine. They then uh, unloaded it. Everything was fine. Sometime 24 hours later, uh, it opened up like this. And they saw inside it that there was debris, materials that were not part of, the, uh, of that manufacturing process that were inside. So uh, they were not controlling. There's a thing called FOD, F-O-D, has to do, I forget what that means, but it, or, or what, what the acronym stands for, but it has to do with undesirable materials getting into various structures. And uh, with a car carbon fiber composite, you have to be extremely clean. You should be operating in a clean room environment. And Boeing that made that tank did not. And so, oh. they, so they ended up with some problems. And that could be the concern for, for SpaceX, that they can't control the process well enough. Right, right. I think that's exactly the reason is one yeah. of those reasons. But I love carbon fiber composite, and uh, when when we were when, when I was at Fisk and uh, we were building, and, and and they are still doing it now. Most of the rockets were carbon fiber composite, and we we learned how to make our own composite materials. But then it was just better to just buy it from some from a supplier. Right, I understand. I think the audience understands questions, Hemant. Hey um, any other questions? We'll wait for a minute for other questions because I think almost all questions are uh, done. Mossam and other people, Harshil, I, I see a lot of questions and I'll say focus on uh, rocketry a bit, not, not on astronomy. Other than that, we also have webinars now upcoming in these five to six days that will answer the same exact questions that you have asked, like the amount of material that should be preferred for manufacturing, best quality heat shields and all. We have webinars coming from our members. We'll wait for a minute for another question. Okay, uh, greenhouse gas uh, gas-free rockets. Okay, this is interesting for Dr. Rudy because he's also working in green propulsion. Yeah. Any, any suggestions, Dr. Rudy, for green propulsion? Well, the, the, the worst offender is the solid uh, motor. You know, the, the solid motors make a tremendous amount of uh, well yeah there, there, there'd be greenhouse gases but just in general pollution they they really pollute when, when, when because it's essentially like like burning an entire junkyard full of old car tires in a matter of minutes so you can imagine how much uh material you're the particulate and such you're putting into the atmosphere so the solids and there's not um, I guess they could make them cleaner burning by, by making them hotter or something, but, um, but, but they're, they're, they're pretty bad. Uh, then, I mean, the, the perfect, the perfect engine was of course the space shuttle main engines because you're only making water, you know, you're, you yeah. are, combust you're combusting hydrogen with oxygen making water. And so, uh, that is the ideal thing to do. It's difficult to make it work properly. And you'll, you'll notice like SpaceX, you know, and, and pretty much everyone else is instead, instead of using a hydrogen, they're going to use kerosene because it's cheap and you don't have to worry about it boiling off. Um, and in what I envision us doing, we'll probably have a bipropellant engine uh, burning kerosene with hydrogen peroxide. And uh, I like hydrogen peroxide because you don't have to uh, maintain it in a cryogenic state. You can leave it at room temperature. And so you have both your propellants would be at room temperature. Uh, again, though, you're burning, you're burning kerosene. It's like burning, it's like burning diesel in a truck or an automobile. It's, it's going to pollute. Um, and aside from using a hydrogen and oxygen, I can't think of any way to avoid that uh an interesting uh, aside from that is that the russians contemplated very briefly using fluorine gas instead of oxygen gas because it is a superior oxidizer it's also one of the most highly toxic gases known 
And so uh, to have a tank rupture and release uh, gallons and gallons of fluorine gas, uh, we kill everyone for miles, but it would really work well. Yeah, I think, I think if you are using combustion that it will be polluting, but there are safer options that are coming up. Right. And right. I mean, space travel, in, uh, Vinay Verma has an interesting question. What are some safe to use fuels to begin working with on our projects as a rocket enthusiast? So for model rockets, I think potassium permanganate. Well, that's a question I had for you. Um, can you purchase, first off, can you purchase the, uh, the black powder uh, engines that are made by Estes and uh, uh, Apogee in, the, in India, can you buy those? We cannot buy gunpowder without registration and it's a very big paperwork thing, so we don't do that. We use potassium per manganate, we use it. And with sugar? It yeah, it with sugar. With sugar. Okay. we use sugar, we use per man, uh, potassium per manganate and we use a bit of sulfur, uh, the one person part. Okay, I don't know if you're still going to have time for me to go through this presentation I have, but if I do, I'm going to be talking about what I think is the way you should go with that. So I'll save it for that. Sure, sure. Vinay, your question will be left. It will be given yeah, the answer but we to will, it. But we will address that. Now, it's not without risk. And so um, I want you to be safe, but you can do it. Okay, okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Rudy. I think it will help a lot of people. Uh, what is the future? Getting material. I think there are some questions. I should read them. What is the future of materials? Uh, Harshil is asking the future of rocket and material science. What do you think uh, are the big revolutions that are going to come up in the recent future? I am not sure. Um, the, the, the propellant research, I think material science is going towards 3D printing. Even, yeah. even uh, yeah. 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 agencies are using 3D printing for uh, model rockets and even uh, bigger parts. They, are, they have started using it. I think that right. will be. Oh, yeah. You can 3D print. Uh, nose cone, fins, all that sort of thing out of a robust uh, plastic that you could you certainly use if, if, if you, you know, chose to do that. Um, a carbon fiber composites, more uh, robust material. Um, I, I would say that um, there could possibly be further development in composite structures. I have a, a, a former colleague that that's what he does. At, at NASA, um, carbon fiber with um, with a metallic uh, liner to use as tanks for holding, um, you know, pressurized uh, propellants uh, and uh, also uh, gases uh, is another area that uh, I know a lot's been done, and there may not be any more to do there. But uh, that gets back to that creativity thing I was talking about, though. Uh, the creative person will, will see another way or they'll see something in another area that they can carry over to uh, rockets and uh, possibly apply that. So, uh, but I, I, can't, I, I can't think of, of where to say to go other than propellants, fiber uh, composites, or some kind of composite materials, 3D printing, things like that. that that's what comes to mind. OK. For modern rocket fuels, uh, Guru, Kiran, uh, Guru Kiran has some suggestions. He has said that we can buy ammonium perchlorate fuels. We can also, yeah, we can buy ammonium perchlorate. So, yeah, that's it. We can also uh, use potassium nitrate. It's a good thing. And uh, people are asking about your presentation when you will be giving it. Whenever you want me to. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll give you time for the, in day three for that. Oh, uh, okay. Now, 
Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The small presentation you will give now. You can uh, start if you okay. want to. I'm just okay. read through the video okay. question. In that case, then, um, now if I can if I can understand how this interface works, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll give this a try and see how it goes. Um, and and I, this is going to be roughly thirty minutes. Is that going to work with your schedule? Okay. Let me check with the other members. They will be you. Okay, come them. back to me. I can go. I can leave things out. I can go quicker. Whatever you want to do. Yeah, no, no. We don't want you to leave things out. I think people are interested. Uh, people, guys, comment in the section. Do you want to see the presentation right now that Dr. Rudy has created? And, and this is not the one on green propellants. This is just my experiences at NASA. Okay. Uh, he'll be sharing his experience in NASA. He also has a presentation on green propellants that we'll be giving on day three. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We are. Yeah. People are commenting. Yes. You can. You can uh, start okay, your presentation. So, so, your okay. So I'm going to hit the share button. We'll see how this goes. Uh, video file. Yeah. Share screen. Okay. Uh, yeah. Entire screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I see what. Okay. I see what we're doing here. And oh, that's just very easy okay you should now be seeing my screen and i'm going yep. to um i'm going to activate the slideshow and we'll see how that goes yeah we can see your screen yeah yeah we okay. can see the, the your slide in the full screen so. okay very good okay so what i'm going to be talking about was my my experiences at nasa and i was at marshall space flight center I was at NASA headquarters, and I'm currently at Triton College, which isn't technically NASA, but we're still continuing to do some things there, uh, like with the NASA Mines program. And uh, here's a brief agenda of what I'm going to talk about, snapshot of my 13-year career with the agency. I'll talk about NASA Marshall Space Flight Center Engineering Directorate, the NASA Fisk University Administrators Fellowship Program, the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center Propulsion Academy, NASA Headquarters Office of Education, NASA Marshall Space Flight Center Propulsion Research Lab, and the Triton Fist Propulsion Research Group. And I'm going to start out with the NASA Marshall Engineering Directorate. Now, in the uh, Engineering Directorate, there is the lab materials and processes. So I worked in the materials and processes lab. And in fact, uh, this gentleman here was my supervisor. And I'll just go to the next slide. So in the materials and processes lab, um, here's some of the areas that I worked in. Space shuttle reusable solid motor office. We supported uh, the, the solid motor office, um, the materials testing facility, the X-37 special project that's on uh, hydrogen peroxide compatibility. And I'm gonna be talking about that on Sunday with the talk, the pursuit of green space energy. Then a booster separation motor anomaly. It's an interesting story, I think. International Space Station glove box anomaly, another interesting story. The lunar lander test bed, again, that's hydrogen peroxide compatibility. And the environmental control and life support system it was the last thing I did before I retired. So the reusable solid motor office, or RSRM, uh, produced and, you know, managed the boosters. So you can see here the boosters coming away from the space shuttle still attached to the main tank, and they were dropped into the ocean. And the parts of the booster are shown here. Uh, the propellant is going down through here. And this is essentially a very large version of what you have in a, a high-performance uh, amateur uh, rocket uh, uh, motor. And what is important in using this for manned uh, spaceflight is that it be reproducible. We have to know exactly what the performance would be. I remember working with a gentleman from India who, uh, he was a ballistician, and he would, he would worry, he would fret, he would sweat about whether the performance of the motors were being reproducible. And, uh, and what was really important is since there's two boosters, if you had one with different performance than the other, you would have asymmetric uh, thrust and you would not be able to control the vehicle and we'd lose a crew. So the thrust curves 
must be identical between those two. Now, my part in all of this was to identify any changes in raw materials and manufacturing. So I would go to the places that would make the materials that we would then use to make this, uh, to make the, the propellant. And I would visit them and try to see if they were changing anything because these materials were being made for other purposes. The, the uh, rocket motor business is very small compared to what these companies was actually working towards. So um, they did not give it a lot of attention. So we had to give it attention ourselves to make sure that we know what was going on and if there was some sort of change that might affect uh, what's being done. This is a solid motor test of the five segment uh, RSRM and Thiokol, uh, the, the company's Thiokol and the Ogden, Utah. And I believe a video will play. Let's see if that works. Uh, I don't see anything happening. Oh, there we go. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to see this one. Yeah, we can see and get it. Okay. Now this is a long video, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna show the whole thing. I'll make this available to you guys, and then you'll be able to um, uh, see it. Now I've got to figure out if I can move this up without uh, going to the next slide. Let's see what happens. Oh yeah, that's what I want to do. Okay, you can see the guys in the control room, and this is the point of ignition. I was present for this test. Okay, I want to stop for a moment. Uh, about where my cursor is, there was a mirror. And the mirror would be uh, positioned so as, so as to be able to see down the bore of the uh, motor. And then there was a camera at a right angle to the, where the plume is coming out of the motor so that they could see the flame front moving down the bore of the, uh, of the motor. And of course, <laughs> when, <laughs> when the plume hit that, the, the mirror went flying and they would take bets on how far would the motor go, or how far would the mirror go. Also, this ground around here was so hot that the sand turned into glass. So they were making glass. It's sort of an expensive way to make glass, but they were making glass. And as you can see, this is producing a lot of pollution. I'm going to stop it now because it's not going to change much. Well, if I go out towards the end here, let's see what we have. I'll have to do it like this. Okay, this is uh, as it's burning out. You can see the uh, plume is decreasing. I was in this crowd somewhere. And anyway, I, I'm not going to continue with that any longer, but I'll make the video available to you guys. It, it's on YouTube. And so you can, you can watch it if you'd like to see the entire thing. It's very impressive. This... Uh, the space shuttle, the, the RSRMs were the largest uh, solid motors ever built. There was none larger than these. And uh, it was quite an endeavor to, to, to do that. Okay, so here we go. Do-it-yourself rocket motors. <laughs> this is what the space shuttle, the, the RSRMs, uh, the propellant was, was. It was ammonium perchlorate composite propellant, APCP. And it used ammonium perchlorate as the oxidizer at roughly 70%. Uh, atomized aluminum powder doesn't have to be. Aluminum powder will work as the fuel, 16%. Uh, uh, you have a burn modifier of iron oxide, uh, less than a percent. And then this is all held together by a binder called P-band. 
polybutadiene, acryl nitrile. Uh, you can make car tires from this. So um, many people are doing this. I know someone that makes this and you use uh, what's called a stand mixer, uh, which is the same thing that you would use for cooking, uh, but you need to support the bowl and then you use the mixer. And then after you have uh, made your propellant, you have to have a mold to cast it into and you make these propellant sections across the bottom. These would then go into this tube. You have a nozzle on one end and a solid uh, bulkhead on the other. These are retained by snap rings and uh, there's some gaskets. You should be able to import, if these are not being made in India, you should be able to buy the metal parts, I hope. So you would just be challenged to make propellant segments to go in there. You could also machine your own tubes uh, aluminum is frequently used, but it does weaken with uh, temperature. And as I'm saying here, please, I don't want to. I, I don't want any of you contacting me later saying that someone it was injured. This is a hazardous operation, and uh, we can talk about that further as to as to what the hazards are. Now, if you were wanting to build a very high performance motor for military purposes you would switch out the ammonium perchlorate for a more efficient oxidizer such as ADN or some other thing, or you would add a high explosive. It could be anything from uh, trinitrotylene or you know, TNT to C4. I don't think you can buy either of those <laughs> very easily, but you can make it. I, I'm not recommending any of that because that is certainly dangerous. And the part here of the mixing, uh, many people have been killed doing that part. So that is not a safe thing to do. But if you're wondering how, for instance, the Sidewinder missile that the, uh, that the U.S. uses on the helicopters and aircraft, uh, the Sidewinder missile, um, those were manufactured in the, on the Army side uh, there at, when I was at Marshall Space Flight Center. And those had a high explosive added to was essentially the APCP uh, sort of propellant. So then uh, materials testing facility, uh, I spent a lot of time here. This is where I started out at. I know all the people you see in the picture. This gentleman here was essentially an auto mechanic before becoming a technician. He was a fabulous test uh, technician and um, Anyway, I spent a lot of time in that building. So what we did there was materials testing, uh, promoted combustion testing of metals in gaseous oxygen. And this all came from the loss of a crew in a ground test where they got into the Gemini capsule and the technicians did not understand the difference between air which is a small portion of oxygen and mostly nitrogen and a cylinder of pure oxygen. So they attached pure oxygen to the capsule. And then there was a ignition event probably in the electrical system somewhere in the capsule causing it to ignite and the metal started burning. And once metal starts burning, it's going to burn until it's all consumed. And so, that prompted the, the, the development of the materials test facility and doing this test promoted combustion. Uh, mechanical impact test, again, this is in gaseous oxygen or liquid oxygen. And in this case, rather than deliberately igniting the material, we would see, can you hit it? Can you have an impact that would cause it to ignite? So we drop what's called a plummet onto a pin that's resting on the material that we're testing and you can hear it, it would make us an explosion. And you also have a flash detector that would see the light from it. And that, that, would, be, that would be registered as a positive test. Pneumatic impact test, again, gaseous oxygen, liquid oxygen. This is looking at, instead of metals, soft materials such as rubbers and gasket materials that um, they're used in valves and other pieces of a, uh, of a propulsion system. And the idea here is that when a fluid impacts a curve or some other uh, change in direction, the uh, momentum is being transferred to the wall 
and um, frequently that can cause that that material to ignite and this is a definite concern and it's something that will be a concern uh, even with hydrogen peroxide uh, oxygen compatibility assessment this is just a document that is produced on a particular material where we uh, assess how good is it to use a uh, toxic off-gas products test this is in a totally different direction here we put various materials or devices we might put a laptop computer that we're going to take to the space station inside of a metal container and we would heat it just a little probably around 60 degrees c centigrade and we would uh, then take the gas that's inside the chamber and use a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer to see if it's producing anything that's considered to be toxic because we don't want to be to doing that in a contained environment such as the space show or the international space station vacuum off gassing this is looking at materials that would be in the vacuum of space and will they release some kind of a material that could then fog or obscure a mirror on a telescope or a window uh, on a vehicle because that would be a, a concern so we need to know that that could possibly happen now i want to talk about the booster separation motor anomaly uh, when I was at Marshall, I was in the materials testing lab, uh, we learned that after a launch, after a RSRM had been recovered from the ocean, that uh, some of the propellant had not burned. And this is a depiction of what was seen. This is the way the booster separation motor is oriented inside of the RSRM. So this is what pushes that booster away from the uh, main tank uh, after they have uh, burnt out. So direction of flights upward, force gravities downward, and you see that there's this unburned propellant. And what we, what this geometry indicated was that there was water intrusion into the motor. This should not have happened because out here on the bell of the nozzle, uh, there's a cover. And that cover has a ratchet mechanism that unlatches whenever the motor is ignited. But until that point, you could not open this. And so they went through many tests using fire hoses, trying to get water to go inside of one of these that was closed with the, with the lid down. They could not reproduce it. The root cause could not be determined. I concluded that someone had done it deliberately and no one would believe me. And so they just went ahead and did the next launch and it never happened again. So that will be a mystery forever. Here's another anomaly. This is with the International Space Station glove box. Now the glove box being pictured as a later generation. This is not the one that I was uh, working on. Uh, but anyway, uh, during annual maintenance, an unusual odor was observed. Now what actually happened was one of the smaller astronauts could not reach inside the glove box. So this was not proper procedure, but that person climbed inside the glove box to clean it and they noticed the odor. And then what does anyone do when they smell a odor that they don't know what it is? They invite everyone else over to smell it also. So uh, they became concerned. They contacted uh, Houston and uh, gas samples were returned by a SpaceX cargo vessel and then we also looked at identical units for similar off-gassing. So we had a similar glove box at Marshall, and we were looking at it. And there was one at Kennedy and one at Johnson and some of the other centers, probably Glenn. And we were all looking to see, is there anything in there that could be producing this? And we couldn't find anything. So uh, the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer detected the presence of dimethyl sulfoxide, DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide in the International Space Station sample. Now, what we learned is that DMSO is a natural metabolic product. We are all producing it. It is what gives us what is referred to as bad breath. If someone has breath that is unpleasant, it's probably due to dimethyl sulfoxide. 
It was concluded that the DMSO from the astronauts had accumulated in the filters. We found out the filters had not been changed in 14 years. <laughs> Someone just did not think that was necessary. I don't know how that happened. So uh, when the filler capacity was reached, in other words, the filters had absorbed all of the DMSO that it could, any temperature excursion above the ambient temperature resulted in off-gassing. You, you heat it up and it naturally uh, desorbs that DMSO. And that was what was causing the odor. And so a subsequent SpaceX cargo vessel took up a uh, replacement filters and everything was okay. But we were talking about whether this is toxic to the crew. And there was just a lot of concern for a while because they were thinking that they might have to uh, leave the space station uh, because it was dangerous. Next thing I want to talk about is environmental control and life support system, also known as ECLS. And it's a complex um, system for keeping the astronauts in, uh, you know, safe conditions. And so um, involves various things, uh, the water processing, uh, either to, to have water or to, or to take the waste, uh, controlling temperature and humidity, it has to be a pleasant working, as pleasant as possible working environment. The part that I was involved was carbon dioxide removal. Carbon dioxide becomes uh, uh, toxic at certain levels. If you've seen the film about uh, Apollo 13, whenever they had the explosion, they had to return to Earth. They started accumulating uh, carbon dioxide and um, that uh, they were concerned about being toxic. And they were scrambling to try to figure out how to remove that carbon dioxide. What they used to do this was lithium hydroxide, but the lithium hydroxide canisters were in the command module, but they were, they were in the, uh, the lunar uh, module uh, to come back. And so they had to fabricate a different way to circulate the cabin air through the lithium hydroxide. But anyway, my part, was carbon dioxide removal and then also trace contaminant control uh, uh, for the uh, for the crew. And uh, you see there's another thing here called the saboteur system. And this is for recycling carbon dioxide so as to be able to recover the oxygen, so as to not have to carry as much oxygen on a mission. So uh, this... Uh, this project was put together to try to do a better job of this. And this is the Atmosphere Revitalization Recovery Environmental Monitoring Program, or ARA. And it supports missions such as the International Space Station, the uh, Space Shuttle, uh, or however we're going to get to low Earth orbit. Uh, we were working with SpaceX and some of the other players. Uh, it would support a lunar mission, a Martian mission. Uh, EVA, uh, in, a, in a smaller way, you still have to maintain the carbon dioxide levels in their uh, EVA suits. So my areas, again, was carbon dioxide removal, trace contaminant detection, and removal. So for carbon dioxide removable with possible recycling to oxygen, it involves an absorption desorption process using alumina, zeolite, or some other absorbing material to collect the carbon dioxide. Now this is all thermally and pressure dependent. Uh, what is happening, whether you're absorbing or desorbing is gonna depend on the temperature and the pressure. A minimum of two collectors is required to facilitate continuous processing. If you're absorbing, you cannot be simultaneously desorbing. So here's our crew and they are producing carbon dioxide and it's being absorbed uh, into uh, a, can a canister of aluminum zeolite or some other material. At the same time, the same sort of canister is in a desorption cycle, and so it's releasing carbon dioxide. Now, initially, that was being vented into the vacuum of space. So again, this is thermally and pressure dependent. If you drop the pressure to vacuum and you raise the temperature, it's going to naturally release the carbon dioxide. But the other way that we could go is to do the same thing, uh, not more, well, we could use, we, we used space vacuum as a vacuum source, but then we'd also heat it again and release the carbon dioxide, and then we would recover 
the auction. I'll talk about how that's done in just a moment here. Now, my part in this was absorption, absorbent selection. So this is how we would pick the best absorbent material. I worked with a, I worked for a gentleman, um, Jim Knox, who was the the lead for this, and uh, we we did these experiments. So I was using a stock instrument, a thermogravimetric analyzer, a TGA, except I modified it. So here's a depiction of a TGA. This would be a block diagram of that. It consists of a balance, just like a balance you have in your, in your science labs. And then it is attached to a sample holder. The sample holder is suspended in what's called a furnace. Now, this is a high temperature furnace. Ours did not need to be high temperature. And then we have a purge gas, and that would be our carbon dioxide that we are trying to see, is it being absorbed or diesel -like. So as it says over here, purge gas is some fraction of carbon dioxide in nitrogen. And then we'd use various temperatures. Uh, started out just ambient and elevated, and I was able to, to figure out a way to make it subambient. We couldn't go very much below ambient temperature though. And then uh, the results of this would be a plot like we're seeing here. During the adsorption phase, that's the blue line, you can see that the mass is going up as you're absorbing the carbon dioxide. Then when we raise the temperature and also change the purge gas to nitrogen to move to take away the, uh, the carbon dioxide, we would see that it would desorb the carbon dioxide. This is what we have there. Now, this plot could then be converted into two pieces of data. One would be mass data. That's the capacity. How, what mass of carbon dioxide could we collect on a certain mass of absorbent? And then kinetic data, how fast can we absorb the carbon dioxide versus time? And we use this to compare various candidate materials for future devices. This result in this paper, I'm not going to read all this stuff, but the title, Development of Carbon Dioxide Removal System for Advanced Exploration Systems. This was given at the 42nd International Conference on Environmental Systems. Uh, again, our project manager was Jim Knox. And uh, there's, a, there's an abstract here, but I don't think we really have time to read this. But you, you should have access to my slides later. So the way we can recover oxygen, there's a couple different options. The option that was depicted in the ECLIS diagram is the Sabatier uh, process, and it's currently being used on the International Space Station. So uh, carbon dioxide is reacted with hydrogen gas using uh, at elevated pressure, elevated temperature, 400 degrees C, and a catalyst, the catalyst is nickel or some other... Uh, some other uh, transition metal, and that would produce uh, methane, CH4, and water. And that has an energy uh, a enthalpy of negative 165, so it's an exothermic process. We could then go on to take the methane that was produced, bring it over here, and we could heat it in a process called pryolysis. I'm not saying it today. Anyway, we could heat it. And we could recover the hydrogen, which we could then recycle back into the process so as to reduce the load of hydrogen that we would need available to be able to use this. Now, we haven't produced oxygen yet. We're going to take the water now, and we're going to produce oxygen. So we use water electrolysis. That's currently used on the International Space Station. And uh, the water then is... Uh, broken down into oxygen that we could then breathe, and hydrogen gas, again, that we could recycle up to the Sabatier uh, process. And then uh, the astronaut crew would breathe and produce new carbon dioxide, and this would just continue. Now, another approach to this is the Bausch uh, reaction. And this is better because there's no methane involved, so we don't have to heat the methane. Uh, we take carbon dioxide with hydrogen, and at a uh, very high temperature, we can produce carbon and water. 
which as you saw previously, we can take the water now and get our oxygen from that. So we can take the water again, make oxygen, breathe the oxygen, make more carbon dioxide, produce some hydrogen, reuse the hydrogen. And this next slide is just all this together, and there's the reference for it. But again, no methane's involved with the Bausch reaction. We are not currently using, to my knowledge, the Bausch reaction, uh, and I don't know why, because we had a working uh, version of it when I was there. Okay, that is it on this piece, I believe. Oh, yeah. Now, now we're talking about trace contaminant detection and removal. Uh, we had large chambers. These were originally, um, let's see, these were originally uh, for, for rocket uh, uh, fuel uh, propellant tanks. And someone had given them to us because they were excess. So we were able to take those, those chain, make a sealed chamber that we could open the door and put things in. And this would simulate a crew compartment, such as the space station or space shuttle or some other thing. And the contaminant source could either be compounds added directly, which is known as spiking, or we could put equipment and people inside the chamber and let them produce the contamination. Then the processed air was monitored to identify and quantify what trace contaminants were present. We used a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer again, but my part was this one, uh, the using a Fourier transform infrared spectrometer uh, to identify that. Now, for you chemists out there, you are probably seeing there's an issue here because we're taking a mixture and we're performing infrared spectroscopy and we're identifying and quantifying what's there. Well, that doesn't work normally, but by adding this multivariance uh, analysis uh, software, we are able to separate what is in that mixture and identify and quantify what it is. And this worked amazingly well. I had never seen it prior to this, and I thought that was really an amazing piece of software to be able to do that. So now I'm going to move to the NASA Administrator's Fellowship Program, also known as NAPFI. And this uh, program is a exchange between a NASA scientist and a minority institution faculty person. Now, it's not that you have a NASA scientist go to this institution and a faculty person from the same institution goes to NASA. They could be, and they usually were, from different uh, places but it would still be one for one. There would be one NASA scientist for one faculty person. I chose to go to Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Fisk University was the first historically black college university west of the Appalachian Mountains, and it was built shortly after the Civil War. And my activities there, Institute of Pedagogy Reform, uh, infrastructure development, and the part I'm going to talk about mostly is founded the NASA Student Launch Initiative team with my friend, uh, Professor Kent Wallace, uh, PhD. So the rocket team's beginnings was with this SLI training seminar, University of Alabama, Huntsville. Uh, he is now a physician, this gentleman here, uh, and this is Professor Wallace, and that's a rocket. So the team objectives was to enhance the team members' engineering and project management skills, uh, successfully compete in the SLI competition, provide kindergarten through 12th grade STEM outreach, and also to provide, uh, again, kindergarten through 12th grade teacher STEM training. Now, this was in addition to what the SLI program was asking us to do, this fourth part. So for the SLI competition criteria, in order to win, you had to design, build, and fly a rocket that reaches 5,000 foot altitude with the least deviation from 5,000 feet. So for every foot that you go short or beyond 5,000 feet, uh, you are, points are taken away. And then to design, build, and test a scientific payload, to ride in that same rocket. And I did not say it here, but to also safely recover. If you crash the rocket, you're disqualified. So you could not have a bad landing. 
and to provide a kindergarten through 12th grade STEM outreach. So this was our first year team. Again, Professor Wallace, that's me. This is Jonathan. He was a graduate student. Everyone else here, I believe, were undergraduate students. And there's a rocket. So uh, we had to transition. Well, first off, we had to introduce to the students model rockets because some of them had never built a model rocket before. And then we had to transition them from model rockets to what's called level one, level two, high power rocket certification. Because to purchase the higher powered rocket motors, you had to have that certification. Otherwise it was not allowed. We had to do some other things as the advisors uh, registering with the uh, Department of Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms, uh, it's a federal agency. And what we have here in the picture, uh, this is a cluster um, motor rocket. So we're burning uh, four uh, motors. And these are a challenge to get them to ignite uh, at the same time so you don't have asymmetric thrust. So you can see how we had two conductors that we were clipping onto to the igniters so as to provide uh, equivalent current to all the igniters so it would then do what we're seeing here and all four uh, motors would ignite at the same time so we were able to make it work. We transitioned to high power rocketry over here. Uh, this gentleman here is attaching the igniters for this rocket to launch for him to receive a certification and that's a picture of the initial stages of that launch. So some of the parts of making a rocket, one is your airframe fabrication. And we very early on got into fiber composites. This is a do-it-yourself uh, fiber composite. We started out with a cardboard tube, a fiber tube, um, and then we're applying a, uh, a uh, let's see, what is this now? I don't remember exactly what that fiber is, but we wrapped it in this material and then we're applying an epoxy resin to the outside just with a brush and we could produce a fiber composite uh, tube. We very quickly went to carbon fiber composite and purchasing those. And the carbon fiber composite, the dust is hazardous. So that's why they're wearing respirators because of the, the dust can, and also wearing uh, the uh, the bunny suits, as they're called. Here we are, we have a, a airframe tube, we have a support for it, and we're getting ready to drill some, some holes in that. And this is part of a fuselage uh, in stages of assembly. And this is an upper part. Reason why we have a clear section is we had a camera in there to be able to make a movie uh, from, the, uh, from the rocket. And uh, this is... Um, uh, I'm not going to think of his name right at the moment, but anyway, he, he's gone on to being an astrophysicist, but anyway, uh, he is putting together the motor mount for the uh, airframe. So after we fabricated it, this was our largest rocket we ever made. Uh, this was 18 inches in diameter and roughly 20 feet long. This is a very big rocket and uh, pretty ambitious to do. So then we needed to integrate our electronics package into the rocket. This is our, all of our electronics. Uh, this was a mock-up. So this is actually pieces of cardboard. We later replaced those with uh, carbon fiber composite uh, circles. And uh, then that was mounted on these threaded rods using the nuts to separate it and then the different parts of that. And this is the ground station for our telemetry. Um, we, this was attached to an antenna and uh, then we would have a connection to a uh, computer because we were able to then collect our data on the computer. And this is, he's just working on some of the electronics. So our electronics consists of a power supply, required quite a few batteries to do that. A flight computer. The flight computer um, puts together all the information and controls. And 
what's really essential, and you guys are going to need to do this, is to use a flight computer so as to have staged recovery so that you deploy a smaller parachute at the apogee, the highest altitude of the rocket, and then it comes down pretty quickly. And you want it to because that way it does not move into an undesired location. We don't want the air currents to carry the rocket away. If you're at 5,000 feet, it could drift quite a ways. So then the flight computer using an altimeter will then deploy the big parachute, the main chute, at roughly 400 feet above the ground, maybe 300 feet. So as to uh, slow it down so you have a soft landing, but you are not drifting. Now ours also had a GPS uh, system in there. So we, would, we, we got XYZ coordinates of the location of the rocket at all times. And we were able to plot that out. Uh, we had a ground facing video camera. So we were able to see as we were leaving the ground this would all come back to the ground station using a telemetry. And then the experiment package for this rocket was atmospheric temperature and pressure. So this is our first year uh, competition. This is a smaller electronics package here that's going in. And uh, that's the rocket. It's being mounted on a launch rail. So unlike the rocket I showed you where you had a tube that would go around a rod, you have uh, what's called buttons. Uh, they're nylon uh, pieces that fit into this rail, and that guides the rocket uh, until it achieves a sufficient velocity to become aerodynamically stable. This is the uh, rocket motor, and we're attaching this cable that then goes to the parachutes. And this is a video of the first year competition. I hope that video got you excited because that's something that you can do. So in the first year competition, uh, he's holding a certificate of participation. Um, we had first place in altitude. We achieved 5,000 feet with the least deviation from that value. And we got a second place overall. And that was very good for the first year. That was the best we ever did. <laughs> it was it was there was more competitors later on at this point i think there was only 12 or 15 competitors so this is our kindergarten through 12th grade stem outreach uh, this young lady uh, is showing uh, something about rockets i believe she's talking about the parachute to these students the students are building their own rockets you can see the the fuselage tube and then this is a very young student and he, I think, is building a, he is assembling a rocket out of just paper and uh, adhesive tape. And then you can put it on a drinking straw and blow into the straw and the, the rocket will go across the room. But here we are launching the rockets that the student built. I'm helping this young lady get hers hooked up to the igniters. And then we took the big rocket out and showed it to the students and they all gathered around for a photo op. This is our kindergarten through 12th grade teacher STEM training. These are high school. This is ninth grade through 12th grade uh, teachers. And we did a in-service workshop where we took them from building model rockets to building high power rockets. There's two of the people, two of the participants with their finished rockets. Here they are on the field getting ready to launch them. They launched them and they received a level one uh, high performance certification. That's what he's holding there. I took the students to a place called Arnold Engineering Development Center. It's got the world's largest wind tunnel. It was built by the Germans and after World War II it was dismantled and brought there. They have two other wind tunnels. They have very large test stands for testing uh, rocket motors. And, and rocket engines, and then they test uh, 
turbines for passenger aircraft and they'll do testing in adverse conditions such as um, throwing debris into the motor and seeing if it survives, uh, salt spray, things like that. So now I want to talk about the Propulsion Academy at Nash and Marshall. And uh, it's a residential summer advanced internship at NASA and the student teams develop a propulsion product under the guidance of a NASA propulsion engineer. I was the academy coordinator. They met with me every week. They actually had breakfast with me every day before they would go off to their project with the propulsion engineer. And, th and then I took them to visit uh, governmental, uh, academic and industrial propulsion facilities. Uh, the participants built uh, a level one high powered rocket and received certification just as those teachers did and also the, the folks on the uh, FIS rocket team. So here we are visiting Stennis Flight Center. This is in Mississippi. It's, uh, there's nothing around it. It's in the swamp. So if something blows up, it's not a big deal. Uh, this was the group that attended. And we also have, I think this is the center director and then a couple of the engineers. And this is a control room for testing large rocket engines such as the space shuttle main engine. This picture up here is what was is what was called the aerospike engine. It the nozzle only had one side. The other side was uh, was open and they used the pressure, atmospheric pressure to provide the other side of the nozzle. And so it was an adjustable bell because as it went up into space, it would open up and so it would better couple to the uh, pressure. This is some sort of an engine test stand. I have no idea what. This is a space shuttle main engine test stand, and those are just propellant tanks. Here we visited ATK Thiokol. They have a rocket park where the general public can come up and see all these different uh, rockets that were built by ATK Thiokol. This is that five segment uh, RSRM that I would come back later and see them do the test on with uh, all of the uh, interns in this in the propulsion academy. And then finally we went to NASA Kennedy Space Center. We arrived very late at night. We drove straight from uh, Marshall over because we were hoping to see a shuttle launch but it was scrubbed because of some issue. Uh, the uh, Students are standing in front of the countdown clock for the launches. This is one of the launch gantries, and this is a liquid hydrogen tank. No, not liquid. That's a gaseous hydrogen. So now I'm talking about my time at NASA headquarters office of education. I spent 18 months there. It was a temporary detail where I served as the acting portfolio manager and the, data, the, the database development project manager. So as portfolio manager, I worked with the gentleman, Brian Yoder. Uh, he was the evaluation manager. And what we did was monitor the performance and the financial reporting of all NASA education projects. There are a lot of projects. You would be surprised if you saw how many different options they have. And then as the database development project manager, I know very little about programming. I can do a little, but I, uh, I hired this gentleman, uh, Mo Edgelali. He was our senior technical project manager. And uh, we monitored the contractor that was producing the database that would capture all the NASA educational efforts, all of the metrics from that. And this is just a picture to show I was there. This is NASA TV, and I'm sitting with a friend of mine, Kevin Zari, and he was also at the at the uh, NAT, at the headquarters at Office of Education, and we're we're in some kind of meeting, and I'm not sure what this was. So now I want to talk about the Propulsion Research Lab, although I'm really not going to. And here's a picture, and uh, because what I'm going to say is we'll talk about this on Sunday, Pursuit of Green Space Energy. And the other thing is the Triton Fisk 
Propulsion Research Group, and I'm going to say the same thing again. This will be discussed on Sunday. Uh, these are the references. Um, as I said, uh, I will send this uh, this uh, presentation uh, to SARC, and they can disseminate it to you folks. And my last thing here is my contact information. I'm hoping this that this meeting is truly closed, and I'm not going to get start getting uh, spammed with a lot of undesirable stuff. But anyway, uh, this is my uh, school. Uh, email uh, address. This is my LinkedIn, and you you are welcome to connect with me. A lot of you have on LinkedIn. I think it's a very good vehicle to stay aware of what each other's doing. Uh, then uh, I have a group for propulsion. If you want to join, tell me you want to join. I'll send you an invitation. You can join the group with uh, the students at Fisk University and at Triton. I also have a presence on a virtual reality world called Second Life. There I'm known as Rudy Valeska. <laughs> and uh, to go to Second Life, <coughs> excuse me, that's the URL for Second Life. But what I suggest you do is to go to Rockcliffe University Consortium at this URL, and that would allow you to produce a uh, uh, your, your presence there in Second Life. And, uh, and then once you've done that, let me know and I can make you a friend and you can join our group there. And we've had meetings there on and off. We have a, we have a permanent presence in Second Life at Rockcliffe University Consortium. This is my mailing address. I doubt you're going to want to mail me anything, but just in case. And if you want my phone number, I'll give it to you on request. So that concludes my presentation. So... I'll stop sharing my screen. So we should be back to where we came from. We are back, Dr. Rudy. Thank you for the presentation. You bet. And if you have any questions about any of it, I can do that. I think people have some questions because it was very informative and interesting for us. Okay. The part where you showed us the rocket launches and model rockets. Okay, Vinay uh, has a very simple question about uh, predicting after whole designing process, how can I predict that my rocket will work or blow up before actually launching it? Are there any softwares to see the apogee of the rocket that yeah. will launch? Okay, um, there are two software packages that I know of. There's probably some other ones. One is called RockSim. Um, Let's see. It looks like I can put that in the chat, so I'll do that. Uh, let's see, I think it's okay. I believe that is correct. And the other one is uh, Open Rocket. Open Rocket, yeah. And either one of these will predict the performance. Uh, that's something I didn't really talk about when when we were developing the rockets at Fisk, because we were trying to achieve the five thousand feet. And the idea is that you do an initial prediction and then you go out and you launch with that particular motor and you see how close you get to the altitude. You take the results of that launch, you put it into either Rock Sim or Open Rocket, and you can adjust parameters to try to match the results that you're getting. And from that, you will eventually get a better model. So it's a uh, iterative process of where you have to uh, first predict, launch, take the data, change your model, and keep doing that until you perfect that. Now, that's going to tell you the performance. Now, as far as it blowing up, the only thing that can blow up is your propulsion system. And if you're buying it, those will not blow up. Well, that's not true. Occasionally, they do blow up. If you make your own P-Ban uh, or other approaches to that, uh, that can blow up. Um, and it's just a matter of reading what other people, because the people that you're going to be reading in many cases are hobbyists, and they are not trained in many cases. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not trained. But they still will have practical information that you can incorporate in what you're doing to perfect your, your propulsion 
uh, skills. I'll, 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 I'll go one more time. I want to say it's dangerous. So please be careful. And if you want, if, if you want to have a, uh, a talk on safety sometime, let me know and we can put together a safety talk. I think that would be a good, I think that would be prudent before you do very much with that, unless you have someone there that's qualified to do that. Yes, Dr. Rudy, we'll discuss that. Um, I think there's some, a little bit of problem with the internet. We'll be for other questions by that time. I'm not hearing you. I don't know if something has stopped or what. Hello, Dr. Okay, Bidia. sorry for that. I guess he's having some internet issues. He has come yeah, back. It's, yeah. been raining. it's been raining whole day. So I think the internet was cut up for a bit of time. What's well, up, right? That, that, yeah. that happens. I, I understand. <laughs> it's good to be back again. I think uh, yeah, the internet now. came very early. Otherwise, it should not have. Well, well, by the way, thank you, Dr. Rudy, for the presentation. Even oh, I didn't know it is interesting. Um, people, I think, have some questions. OK. Um, Karan Singh has a question. What is the maximum altitude model rockets can reach? Are there diff You were talking about the different levels um, Are they dependent on the height? I think a black powder commercial motor, C motor, or D motor probably can reach 2,000 feet. I believe that's probably, it, they might be able to do more than that. Now, with the P band high powered engine or motor, it's unlimited. <laughs> pretty much you could reach oh. in yes oh yeah you can uh, yeah you could certainly reach twenty thousand feet uh, you could probably go to um, it's it's hard for me to say because we're so restricted in the united states on what we can do that uh i mean i can't go and launch to twenty thousand feet where i am uh i have to go to new mexico or someplace that's more remote we have to apply to the FAA for a clearance to that altitude, and they'll divert uh, the uh, the airliners away from that. And um, but it can be done. Uh, there's the uh, the New Mexico spaceport uh, is a good place for that. Uh, there's a place in California, um, or you can get a boat and go out in the ocean and do a lot of things. Um, but that is. Your, your, the, what limits your altitude is the government and money. Okay. If you, if you have the money, you can go to any altitude. That's <laughs> right. I mean, the amount of fuel that you can put into it. Yeah, I think I have seen 20 feet long rockets have an apogee of about 3,000 feet or 2,500 feet. I mean, that's a good amount for a model rocket. And we can even reach more. Yeah, yeah. Well, you see, well, our rocket went to went to five thousand, and that was our uh, that was our clearance for that for that day of launch, and uh, that's not too hard to get that approved. I mean, when we would test, we would call up the FAA center in our area and request a clearance to that altitude, and they would grant it, and then we could launch, and no problem. Okay, cool. There, I, let's see if there are any other questions. Guys, and, if you're liking the interaction. Don't where your school is located. But it's the southern part of the country, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, our school is a bit in a bit a remote, remote place. So we are pretty chill with the launches. Because <laughs> not to be <laughs> not to be negative or anything, but if you were closer to Kashmir or uh, Pakistan, I would not be launching rockets. As you can I think it's a, I think there are laws to limit that in those places. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, of the obvious uh, 
misunderstanding that could occur, and that would be a disaster. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, I think I think uh, there's a ban in sale of uh, gunpowder and all things mm -hmm. at that place also. But uh, here, political stability allows us to do that, and also right. our college is very remote, so we're like right. five kilometers out of the city. So we do have free space to do that. Mm. Okay, Rakesh, the rocket designing part, Dr. Rudy just discussed it with us. The amount of fuel that has to be used, and all those and those part. Guys, if you're liking the interaction say yes because uh, thank you dr rudy you did the presentation and the interaction i think let's see if there are any questions otherwise okay. we'll take your leave there are about uh, 47 to 50 people right now by the way let's when we wait for comments i don't think there are any more okay yeah people people are really uh, Writing stuff. Thank you, Dr. Rudy. Oh, you're welcome. Sumana, Sahar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, oh, thank you for being here. There are a lot of people saying yes when I asked the question if uh, the session was informative. Yep. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, There's something about please share yeah. something. I didn't catch it, though. Um, Vinay has a question, I think, on how model rocket have accurate stabilization. You can use the CPCG model in open yeah. rocket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's just a matter of the location of center of pressure and center of um, uh, center of mass. And as long as you perfect. have that, as long as you do that, and if you have fins, you're going to be okay. <laughs> I mean, fins pretty much guaranteed. As long as the rocket is not too short and you have fins, it'll be stable. Right, right. Uh, now the comment is just flooded with thank you sessions for you. So thank you so much, Dr. Rudy, for yes. being with us. Well, today. thank you for, for, for taking the time. I, thank I, you. I it was a pleasure that. having you in front of us today. And I'm sure the audience feels the same. I'm sure you, the audience enjoyed your company and even appreciate the time that you gave to us. We learned a lot from your session. Thank you, Dr. Rudy. Right. Guys, does anyone have to say anything for Dr. Rudy? If you guys do, Please share. I mean, there are a lot of things that our members wanted to say. What time is it there right now, by the way? Right now it's 7 p.m. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah. That's nice. We started at 5. Mm, that time is the sunset time in India, mostly in Odisha, the state okay. we are from. And now it's totally night outside. So it's not, not very late. That's good. Ha, ha. It's not very really late. It's just dinner time, if you can say that. We, yeah. we do dinner. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there are any more questions. Your okay. uh, session was broad enough to cover everything. So thank okay. you, Doctor, for being with us today. Okay. I will see you on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. I think people will await your presence there. Okay. Very good. Thank and you. I and I will also I'll join you uh, tomorrow and and observe what you're doing. Sure, sure, Dr. Rudy, you are free to. Okay. Yeah. Good good then. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Okay. Goodbye. Have a good day. Be safe. Be safe, folks. Yeah, we'll be. We'll be. We're with, trying. With COVID, with COVID, be safe, okay? Sure. Yeah. Uh, guys, the audience that is here, thank you for joining us today. We'll be conducting an interactive session on advanced rocketry tomorrow and even uh, advanced rocketry and propulsion tomorrow and my sincere gratitude to all of you who are present today and decided to join this event and keep this interactive this event would not have been possible without dr rudy and without your support the audience thank you guys now we'll take leave okay people are saying bye to you sir so okay. I think bye. have a good evening Yes, sir. Thank you, guys.